Hello and welcome, heroes, to the Crit Academy. I am your host, Justin. I'm your co-host, Brandon. And I'm your co-host, Ian. This podcast was created to provide you, our heroes, with new and reusable material for both players and DMs. We hope to inspire you with creative content that you can bring with you on your next adventure. Our show may not be suitable for young children, but neither is our D&D games. Our main topic today is the Malady Workshop, which is an amazing uh, tool set for building your own fantastical diseases. And of course, we have our Unearth Tips and Tricks uh, segment, where we bring you new and reusable material for both players and DMs. Um, Ian, what kind of things do we include in our Unearth Tips and Tricks segment? A lot. We got like uh, items, encounters, monsters, player tips, DM tips. If you haven't been listening to our show or you're joining us for the first time, back in episode 109, we did the Malady Codex. And my God, what an amazing work of art. Pure genius. And then we have bards everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> um. If you don't know, the, the, the Malady Codex was all about complex diseases and... and, and, and maladies uh, of that nature by Jason Bacos and uh, Themis Periscavis. I apologize if I slaughtered that. Um, and of course it was so popular. I think it, at last I checked, it was Mithril bestseller. They came back Jeez. with a, with a product called the Malady Workshop that we're covering today that basically gives you a step-by-step -step instructions on how to, how to, um, produce these, these amazing, um, yeah. diseases that they came up with. And what's really interesting is they have a lot of, uh, education in this department because they're medical students. So they really, they really know their shit and they actually use inspirations from, uh, real world world diseases um as um uh reference points for their crazy ass shit but i don't know how you find any reference in the fucking mind flayer one that like digs into your mind and allows all the elder brain and and, and shit to see through all the people little like unknowing oh, yeah. spies it was glorious <laughs> definitely check it out you can find uh uh that stuff on dm's yes. guild or if you head over to our website there's links in the, so, the blog section so remember that the codex is a book of diseases that they created right and the workshop is going to let you make your own yeah and so we're going to walk through kind of walk through that process um what i do think is interesting there is a so they got these little kind of notes in here that um, are they're kind of offset and they look like like snippets from some personal guy's notes um and it turns out I, they're from uh uh he says i am a met so it says <laughs> It has become painfully obvious to me that this world has a problem, a plague to all things, living or not, adventurers. These pesky heroes, as they call themselves, always <laughs> mess with the most important plans, even though they have no idea what we are trying to achieve. And there's these little snippets of this shit from this crazy-ass mad mage throughout the entire book, which I think is fabulous. Um, and you kind of get like his perspective on it and why he's doing what he's doing, which is just, it's glorious. So, um, before we get started, what are your guys' overall thoughts of this as you were poking through it? Yeah, well, excellent tools for creating more things you can use against your own players. <laughs> and I love using shit against my players. Uh, anybody, what about you, B? Honestly, one of the first things I thought of when we were reading the, uh, the Codex and 109 was I hope to come out with a book later so we can make our own shit, and apparently they did, so I'm pretty happy with it. <laughs> and it's already a platinum bestseller, so it's definitely uh, worth a look. Um, so so kind of moving on to this, they have a very interesting format that they have when describing the different diseases and um, maladies. Um, they all have an origin, so they'll walk you through that, you know, how it came to be, uh, what caused the specific diseases. I think he's going to blow it up. You got, you got shit? Yeah. You're going to punish, <laughs> Just, punish Justin's throne? <laughs> <laughs> Did you see the picture? I put toilet yeah. paper on the top of my tub or on my toilet <laughs> with another one with little sheets coming out of it so it looked like it had eyes and a cigarette in its mouth and it looked like a potty monster. <laughs> My wife didn't laugh at all, but it got an amazing reaction on the internet. So I saw, I was like, "What the fuck?" <laughs> Anyways, uh, you have the origins, you know how it became to be, and what caused the specific uh, disease to become a threat. What other uh, what other ones do they have? Be I uh, sorry, but my PDF is open on my phone. It's tiny. Is that causes? Yeah, causes is another one. Uh, there's symptoms, uh, diagnosis. 
then there is cures. So basically, it breaks it up to all these different things. You know, the symptom, what does it look like? The diagnosis is how can you tell somebody's infected? The causes, where's the source? And then the cure is what sort of effects can cure it. Now, that's important because while we have spells to cure diseases and everything, not all of them are the are can affect the the diseases that at least were that were in the codex. Yeah. I remember there was one of the codex where it had very specific conditions to be able to cure and it was insanely difficult. Uh I'm I'm really I'm really glad I really like that because it puts the players on a quest to to heal somebody as well as makes skill challenges more or skill checks more important because if you fail a check to identify it you're probably going to fail at trying to cure it, <laughs> which I think is, is fantastic. So um, one of the first things that they do is they introduce, you know, uh, crafting tables, um, which is a, a, a way to provide you with an extensive amount of information that you can utilize in building your your uh, diseases, which it's based, some of them are almost like random tables, but you can also just mix and match them to you get the de desired uh, result that you want. Um, which I think is fantastic. Um, so when you're going through this process and you're, you're looking at the, the malady workshop, um, they break everything down in the diseases by giving them specific uh, categories, um, which basically, uh, any, yeah, they give you these different sorts of categories, like um, this type of disease is penetrative. It's like a kind of a subtext, right? So this means it's highly lethal as it affects even characters immune to normal diseases. Now, that, that's another big one because there's a lot of characters that are immune to different things. They might have a magic item that makes them immune, which is, which is um, amazing. <laughs> so glad you didn't use that recycled gems. Yeah, well. <laughs> Waste not, want not, tater. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking tater. Oh, God. Uh, money from mage. That's awesome. I hope I'm saying that right. Um, so uh, you got uh, – that's penetrative. You have magical, divine, natural. Basically, in this category, um, uh, it can be useful for deciding the type of skill check you need to ask the player because not everything is related to na na natural. Um, so nature isn't always the check that you need to identify whether a disease – um, and w what the disease is and what the cure is. Some of them are based on arcana checks um, or uh, magical effects are arcana, divine are religion, and then, of course, natural nature. So it now breaks it up that not all of them are natural, which I think is fantastic. Um, what are, what's another one? Yeah, lethal and non-lethal, which, of course, there's lethal diseases that lead to death if not treated, while one could survive with a non-lethal disease. Yeah. And that, <laughs> that was kind of, uh, kind of straightforward. A given, given, yeah. Uh, malformative, internal. A malformative disease is visible to other creatures, while an internal one may remain hidden to the naked eye. Right. I would think like um, ah, I see. Uh, an internal um, effect, uh, I, I would say like a cancerous effect that's below the surface isn't as obvious as somebody whose eyes are bleeding <laughs> because they've got a disease like eye rot or something. Um, and then you have crippling, which is mild. So um, crippling disease affects... a character's lifestyle this includes constant pain throwing up um other sorts of debilitating uh um uh diseases that will affect you and some of that might even just be flavor too um if you've got a character who constantly has to run to the shitter that may not seem like a big deal but how inconveniencing would that be <laughs> if you're sitting there talking to royalty about how you're going to oh excuse me i gotta go and there's no toilet nearby i'm holding uh, and you, as you're running out the door, the doors bust open, and you just stop dead in your tracks. I didn't make it. <laughs> so I like stuff like that. Um, and it could be a little more uh, inconveniencing, like uh, the hiccups, that when you're trying to cast a somatic component, maybe you go <laughs> and cast, you know, something else. <laughs> Huh, I didn't know what spoke to make bubbles. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, of course, you also get, like, uh, chronic pain. Um, it's usually obvious and a worrying symptoms, but are generally cured pretty easily. Um, some are very s subtle and some are not. I like the idea of having a, um, a, a chronic, uh, like, pain in your hand. So you, maybe your character wields a shield and uh, a one-handed sword, and he's got this chronic pain in his left hand, so he's always wielding a shield instead of, like, dual-wielding or something. Which is kind of not fun, though, because, like, I actually, in both my hands, have tendonitis. <laughs> oh, man, that sucks. That, that would blow. You're trying to uh, block an incoming attack, and, and the DM says, oh, that's with disadvantage because your hand hurts. 
<laughs> well, shit. Uh, did you destroy my toilet? No more than usual. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> crap. <laughs> that was not intentional. Um, <laughs> oh, I, my well, God. I, <laughs> Nader says, Tater says we should have locked the door. <laughs> 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 what? Um, anyway, so moving on. So um, uh, one of the ways that they actually give a way to uh, – um, help balance to make sure you don't overpower your diseases. Brandon, how do they do that? Uh, they have a table here with a malady point system. Okay. And the minimum MP for all malady points, MP, uh, for the origins, causes, symptoms, diagnosis, cures with resistance, cure with specific, and the sum, it's all zero. Right. And then it looks like it's got some additional details at the bottom here that says, you know, um, if you want to add optional rules, you increase the points by this. Um, once again, it's very cool because it gives you a balancing system to make sure your diseases aren't going to outright just be horridly designed. And they also give you a, a uh, lethality table. Ooh, that's interesting. I didn't notice that earlier. Talking about how, okay, the more push you have, the worse it is. Like, uh, <laughs> 0 to 20, mild discomfort. 40 to 60, requires action. Above 80, Insanely deadly. <laughs> <laughs> Very. So that that's really cool. So uh, we mentioned earlier how they have the different um, uh, categories, right? So uh, the first one being origins. So they have a whole a couple different tables here. They got looks like three, four, three. Yeah, natural, three arcane, different tables. and divine. So each one of these gives you kind of a little bit of a few segments of what would be there. Brandon, what's a, a natural uh, origin? Let's see, random choice, I'll choose number four. Uh, disease carried by a traveling group. Okay, so that's pretty easy. That could be a merchant, that could be an adventurer, that could be a traveling troop. Oh my god, that could be an entire adventure hook. A traveling troop that's carrying a disease, but they're the carriers, so they're not aware of it. And every time they leave, it leaves this like deadly illness behind. And so part of the adventure is figuring out who's poisoning these people when it turns out they're not doing it on purpose. We need you to find patient zero and bring them back. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, oh, I'm shitting out my mouth. That would be such a fun adventure. Hey, to all the DMs Guild adventure writers out there, uh, I want that. Please do that, somebody. <laughs> Jeff Stevens, uh, JVC Perry, uh, MT Black. Please, please do that. Ah, <laughs> uh, uh, crap. That reminds me. I really need to watch. finish watching The Kingdom on Netflix. Way to derail the conversation. Is there a correlation there? <laughs> actually, yes, there is. Like, it's actually a Korean zombie show. Okay. But they actually go b b all the way to make it very clear, this is a disease. <laughs> oh, very cool. So, um, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, it just it kind of, you made a quick connection there. Um, the, uh, the You get another tip. So, that's kind of an example of one of the natural ones. You have an arcane origin. Um, I'll pick a random one here. The disease is released by casting forbidden spells. So once again, this is something cool because everyone has fought the, the, the necromancer raising an army or some shit like that. What if there was a side effect of that besides dead people <laughs> or undead people? Uh, or both, I guess. Um, what if the side effect is that after the the, play, the, the players, you know, rescue the uh, the the village from the the crazy necromancing undead summoning guy, uh, they they learn after they're gone. Maybe they've gone on to Waterdeep or some other big you know uh, city. They hear now that that town is under this dire illness and are asked to investigate. It turns out that they failed to do something and to contain it because of the results of that spell. They have slowly spreading necrosis. <laughs> you, you thought about Ri Rise of the Shield Hero, didn't you? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Giving away my secrets. Uh, Ian, uh, what are the, Again. can you pick one of the divine ones for us? Yes, that's right. And yes, you heard that right. There is a divine origin for diseases. Oh, yeah. There's like a few pretty awesome options here. Ooh. Just pick one that looks pretty. They all look pretty. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> pick the one that looks like the equivalent of a California six-foot-tall blonde. Uh, what the what? fuck? I oh. wish. Uh, <laughs> disease brought from hellish realms. Ooh, so uh, brought from like the the nine hells and demons and stuff like that. Oh yeah. Uh, ooh, Tater's got a good one. He says maybe the, the maybe they're escorting a sample of a disease and they need to protect it and deliver it to the world. Like in what? Like or in deliver a, it to protect the world. Like Z Nation. That literally is the plot of that, isn't it? For, for the first three seasons, yeah. Oh wow. <laughs> Brian from Hilarious is the fact that the guy's a total dick. <laughs> so, <laughs> you. So, My precious D virus. So this divine <laughs> origin is pretty cool because you can make this an effect that is part of a claw attack or a bite from any monster or just from the gate itself opening up. 
Uh, maybe the gate opens up and, and, and this, this um, shit spews out of it. Maybe it's insects. Maybe you deliver it in the form of demonic insects that come out and start just biting people, like, you know, something along those lines. Um, and so they've got multiple uh, options for each one of these. Um, once again, they're tables to help you kind of build your build your disease. Um, the next segment that they talk about is you know the cause, and I kind of want to touch on this because I look. There's a bunch of these, but I think this one's cool. It's another one of the little notes from the Mad Mage. You see the way, you see the way you choose to have a malady spread is critical to its success. You need to know your victims and carefully design a system for them to definitely succumb to it. That's awesome. <laughs> Those little things really, really, what the fuck is going on over here? <laughs> Tater. Tater says, if you ain't twitching, don't be bitching. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, so, uh, so the causes, obviously the mad mage Moo thinks it's, uh, is it, you think that's Moo or Mew? M-U. Mew? Is it Mew? I think Mo. you can go either way. Wah. <laughs> he can't be that terrifying. He's Moo. <laughs> to be fair, that was the name of the villain in Monster Rancher. Yeah, that was. How, how, how does anybody even remember that show? All right, so, <laughs> Brandon, why don't you uh, tell us? So, so you got another table here, a D10 table for mundane transmissions. It looks like you just get the mundane stuff. No, I think it's funny that you say mundane stuff, but not any of these are mundane. You don't think so? No. All those are mundane. Well, given the other options, magic, but. Well, yeah, okay, given the other options, magic, but in the real world, these are not mundane. <laughs> An airborne virus is not mundane. No, it is not. Well, <laughs> uh, let's see. We got airborne, uh, food, water, congenital. That's good. Birth, uh, scratch. Yeah, you don't want to. You don't want to read them all, man. And sexiness. Sex, sexual <laughs> transmitted disease. So those are kind of the <laughs> typical ways you would expect the disease to be transmitted. The food one I use all the time um, because I have the uh, the players when they do uh, survival checks to search for food. Um, if they roll really low, sometimes they come back with something poisonous and people get sick. Um, I love running stuff like that personally um, because it makes that survival and that scavenging for food important. And it gives me a way to punish them for rolling really poopy aside from just, oh, by the way, there's a dragon and it attacks you, you know. Um, but uh, so some uh, a couple of the, the magical transmission disease transmissions that I really like. Uh, clerical. This almost sounds like a clerical error, right? <laughs> Uh, but I'll see what I did there. Um, so the disease is bestowed upon a creature by a cleric specifically. Um, that's interesting because you would need a cleric that is not – either their intent is malice, which is pretty uncommon for a cleric. I guess a death cleric could, would be kind of fit in that line or a war cleric. I now want a disease spread by accounting. Oh, God. Um, another one that I really think is really cool, and there's there's ten of them on here, but um, experiments. Experiments is one that I think just makes sense. Uh, mages be just throwing all kinds of crazy ass concoctions together and <laughs> uh, concoctions together does. that really can result in a plethora of different res uh, issues and in, in, in problems. So a increase the power. What's gonna happen? I have no idea. <laughs> no. The other, the one thing I want to touch on is we're talking about the tables and kind of reading into it, but there are paragraphs of content and, and breakdown of why you, how you need to fit these together and what needs to go into the thought process for it, which I think the flavor is just phenomenal. The art's really good too. Um, so the magical ones are pretty cool. Uh, whether it's divine or um, alchemic, alchemic, yeah. So. Alchemical. So now that you've got um, you you've got it narrowed down to what the cause and the source, right? The Those source. are the two things we talk about, or the origin, the origin, the cause. So now that you got that all figured out, you have to figure out how is it contagious, and if so, how how bad, right? So they have a very interesting. Um, they got a table um, which looks like it follows similar to the difficulty for DCs. And so you got trivial to insane at 25. And then each one's got a certain number of malady points, which is the, 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 um, the metric they're using to scale the difficulty. Um, now, once you decide how, how contagious it is, it also has to tell um, how long it takes, right? How quickly does it, does it uh, take to release to the entire public? Um, does it take six months? Does it take two months? Does it take a day? Um, how long does it take to spread? 
And I think that probably directly correlates to how easy it is to contract, right? I'm sure that would be a factor. So. Yeah. Which I think is pretty cool. And once again, there are just several several paragraphs on the, the intricacies of this because these guys are doctors and have clearly done their homework. <laughs> Well, being medical students. Yeah, uh, or they're not doctors yet. They're medical students. Thank you. Um, and, okay, so now that you've got the contagious part, they, they have a whole on uh, – what is, what is the, the, next, the next step? Symptoms. Which can this – is, this is where I think you can have the most fun with yeah. building a disease is the symptoms in the process um, is how – what happens? Does the person piss themselves? Do they do they blink and <laughs> cough uncontrollably? Do they have uh, outrageous diarrhea all the time at inconvenient times? Does their skin begin to turn different colors? You know, do they get dry mouth so they have to drink as much uh, water every day? Um, Dare asks, does it cover how the disease is uh, vectored, aka spread mechanisms? Um, it does touch into that uh, how everything spreads. Um, and they go into it. I didn't go into all the details, but they got a chart here, and you roll on it, and uh, as the DM, you determine a few things. Um, but they do go into great detail on that. There's a lot here, and we're not just going to read their product, but they do cover that. And there's a crap ton of tables in this thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, so now that you got the sy- symptoms, um, they come in a variety of different things, you know. And if you don't know, you know, symptoms symptoms are, are the, the result of them being ill, right? The the, the way they, they behave or ways to identify their their the 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 illness, right? Mm-hmm. Like uh, this says the red liquid is hot and wet and prevails in the catava- cardiovascular I can't even say half these words, damn it. Cardiovascular, cardiovascular and respiratory system. Um, so in this one you could tie the uh, the symptoms to something with breathing, right? Um, maybe they cough a lot or they're, they're sluggish and, and slower in their he- breathing. Um, I, or maybe they get exhausted easier. Maybe when they do that trek through a mountain, it catches up to them really quick. Right. Um, what do you, what else do you guys think about the, the symptom section here? I don't understand the liquid thing. It's just, it's, uh, these four liquid. So in this one, it's talking about the theory of four liquids. <laughs> Um, which is a thing uh, being written by the Mad Mage. Uh, basically, the full because it's like, what color is the liquid coming out of the body? There you go. Thank you. He he summed that up better than I could. Oh. Uh, what color is your stool? <laughs> if it's red, it suggests... <laughs> it's su- white. Okay, so if it's red, it suggests <laughs> that it's a cardiovascular respiratory system issue. Um, if it's brown... See, I feel like that would just be normal. Flush it down. <laughs> but it says if it's brown and uh, is cold and wet, it prevails within the skin, muscles, or skeleton, uh, the digestive system, and the specific race uh, uh, accessories. Ac- accessories. That's interesting. So that's pretty detailed. That's what you guys would expect from some s- medical students. Um, so they also talk about um, increasing the lethality. I don't want to talk too much about that. It's another table. Um, little things you can do to make it a little more um, dangerous. What I want to talk about is the staging, and I think this directly correlates to what Tater was asking. Um, in real life, you know, most diseases do not manifest with you know, all their systems at the beginning. Um, so they encourage you to divide the effects of your diseases over the span of maybe three to five different time periods. So you might start off with, you know, bleeding eyes, and then you might start to go blind, and then maybe your your eyes become sensitive to light or something like that. So it doesn't happen all at once. It spreads over time. What do you guys think about that? Ooh, I like that because it's very realistic. I mean, that's how diseases usually tend to work. Because... It, because it comes in stages, you may not necessarily be able to get sick right away, so you keep spreading it as you travel. Ooh, so if your adventurers are infected, then they don't know it. <laughs> right, yeah, and I think we made something similar with our um, cackling zombie, yep. where the effect doesn't take place until hours later after you fought the zombie. Uh, it's one of our monster variants in our Honor Tips and Tricks book. If you haven't picked it up, you can go pick it up at DM's Guild, or if you can see the panels down there, click the Honor Tips and Tricks, or you can click the link on our website. Uh, okay, advertising done. Um, <laughs> but what <laughs> happens is... Sneak that in there. <laughs> it, uh, it, um, <laughs> the, 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 the zombie itself, when you fight it, it's cackling, and the, the adventures will slam, they'll be done with them, and they won't think nothing of it. You just ask for some con saves and just leave it at that, and then like four hours later, 
you make them make another one and it potentially spreads to anybody nearby. And it's just a, so having a, a stage effect of something that changes over time is, is, is really a great way to, uh, it's a great effect to have. Um, yeah, I think that's necessary because we've all been there before where, uh, you see someone that you've been hanging out with a lot, whether it's your wife or your children, and one of them starts getting really sick and they get the flu. But you also know that the... Uh, it's only a matter of time. <laughs> uh, that, what was it? The symptoms for the flu only appear like two weeks after they've contracted it. Mm -hmm. So chances are you have it already too. <laughs> <laughs> what's really cool though, and, and um, I think what's interesting is the more symptoms you got, maybe the DC to determine what it is goes down. So maybe the person <laughs> does a medicine check for a natural disease and they don't identify it. But then another symptom appears. You give them another check, and you lower the DC. And the more, uh, the farther along they are in the process, the easier it becomes to identify. Now that yeah. being said, they have quite the list of symptoms, um, and I think some of them are just hilarious because some of them really may or may not have too much of an impact, but can really be fun role play like this one. So this first chart is broken up by uh, brain and the central nervous system. Uh, symptoms and one of them is senile dementia. You progressively forget memories of the past. <laughs> now that can start off. That can start off as something as give me a history check. Oh, you don't remember. It can be very something in passing, right? Mm -hmm. But the next day, somebody to, you you might the next session you might play and somebody might ask your character something and the DM says you don't remember. Don't I get a check? No, you don't remember. What? Well, that's weird, but okay. Um, and, and you can systematically include it. And it's a way to go F you the players who don't pay attention. <laughs> oh, God. I never even thought of that. That's genius. Um, is there any one of these that – so they got them in mundane symptoms and magical symptoms. Is there any one of these uh, brain uh, symptoms that jumps out at either of you guys you think is really interesting? Parencephalitis. I am impressed that you could say that. <laughs> you lose your footing at random moments. Oh, no. <laughs> Make a DC 8, DC 15 if in combat. Dexterity saving throw. On a failure, you drop pro. <laughs> You also have disadvantage on dexterity saving throws. Oh man, that's like that's terrible. <laughs> is that like a is that like a seizure? I'd imagine it's like uh, uh, having vertigo. Oh, I've had that. That sucks. Having vertigo in mid battle, and that you go to swing and everything just starts spinning. You're like whoa, <laughs> you know, just fall <laughs> Son over. Son of a bitch. Uh, Ian, is there a magical one that jumps out of you for the brain? Uh... For, for the brain, for the magical. Ooh, just, uh, just... there's some good ones in this one. Oh. Uh -huh. You know what? I think Brandon's really hooked into somewhere right now. What was the other one you saw? Uh, frontal lobe syndrome. What uh, it say? It's the first one I looked at, and it's sort of interesting. Uh, frontal lobe syndrome. Your personality changes. You become aggressive, impulsive, and unable to see others' point of view, slowly leading you to criminal activity. <laughs> your alignment becomes chaotic evil. Oh, that's fun. That'd <laughs> be great if you're a cleric. <laughs> Just like he starts pilfering from the, the, the offer table or the offer pa pan. Just like, uh, will you pass it around? Of course I will. Oh, uh, the rogue's just looking <laughs> at the cleric like, what the fuck, dude? <laughs> There's something wrong with Johnston. I'm not Johnston anymore. <laughs> you can call me pain. <laughs> <laughs> cleric, heal me. Okay, pay me first. Um, <laughs> so kind of um, moving on from that, they also have digestive systems. Um, I love them. This magic one is called Rocket vomiting whenever you finish a meal make a dc con or make a con save and you vomit forcefully moving you 10 feet in a random direction wow <laughs> you also what feel weak and subtract a d subtract a d4 on any con saving throw for the next hour or until you finish a short or long rest oh that actually the, projectile the, vomiting oh my god <laughs> they had something like that in a couple weeks back in uh, what we do in the shadows on tv <laughs> oh this reminds me of that old uh uh, demonic movie that was really popular when we were young. What is it? The the crazy ass. The Exorcist. Yeah, that's the one. God, I'm stupid. Uh, where she's like, it's just fucking going everywhere, painting the walls green. Yeah. Um, what uh, what's some um a mundane one there, Ian? Well, gonads. They're. <laughs> Good lord, half of these are diarrhea in some way, shape, or form. That, that first one is nasty. Bloody diarrhea. You take one d six damage. You take one damage every six hours. Every week, it increases by one. Oh, no. You should go see a doctor. <laughs> I love that it says that. Yeah. <laughs> you should go see a doctor. Uh, the gonads. Early onset of puberty will hinder your child's growth. 
Its size is small. <laughs> and that's for endocrine, for the record. Not. The uh, oh, I'm sorry. I, I scrolled down too far. Uh, anyways. Um, it, well, we might as well move on to that one. He's going to table. Not for digestive. Yeah. No. Uh, the en- endro- a... the endro- is it endocrine? Endocrine? There's endro- a lot for this one. Endocrine. Endocrine? Endocrine. Do you want to pick one, B? Uh, giantism. <laughs> Actually, okay. giantism does suck. <laughs> I see. Parathyroid. Your calcium deposits are high. If you suffer from this condition for at least one month, your bones become thick as marble. That's fact. Myoskeletal you... marble bones. Which is bad. <laughs> Keep going. Oh, that, that that's it. What? Yeah. It doesn't say there's, there's no like there's... mechanic for it? No, there's oh, nothing okay. to it. But hmm. yeah, if your bones are getting heavy and thick, is that gonna make you more sluggish? Yeah. Mi- perhaps... I'm just thinking like uh Wolverine, yeah. man. <laughs> yeah, perhaps, it's perhaps the medical students forgot that some people who will this aren't in the medical field. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense because uh, there's another one that's just below it where the calcium deposits are low, and it actually has uh, DCs and stuff in it. No. Well, way to pick a good one. You're supposed to pick a good one. All right, found picked a good one. Parathyroid. Your calcium deposits are low, and your bones are fragile. <laughs> if you suffer from this condition for at least one month, your bones become fragile. When you fall from 10 feet, roll a DC 6 con. On a failure, you break one of your bones. Ah. Damn. Breaking uh, shit left and, and that's right. at random. DM's discretion. DM's discretion. For every 10 feet, discretion. DC increases by 2, and you break one extra bone. Uh, that's funny. Or on the magical side. Oh, my God. Melatonin up regulation. Being exposed to direct sunlight for more than 2 hours each day will cause your hormonal system to be dysregulated. You suffer from at least three other endocrine diseases. Cure. Avoid sunlight for a week. Oh, my oh, God. No. Well, that's easy if you're in Underdark, I guess. <laughs> or a I gotta, shifter. <laughs> I gotta, I, I've got to avoid sunlight. Let's go adventuring in the Underdark. <laughs> uh, I, I, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> that's all, that could be a great drow disease, right? Have drows pass that on to people. Yeah. <laughs> or pass it on to a drow. Uh, they wouldn't they'd be affected. They're never going to go into sunlight. Maybe yeah, they already, they already got that. it. Yeah, <laughs> they already have it. That's why they don't go sun, anywhere. Sunlight sensitivity, huh? Uh, all right, so uh, there, and there's a lot of these. Uh, I don't think we need to go through every single one, yes, but I kind of want to touch on a few. There's eyes. There's heart. Uh, the immune system. This one's interesting. So uh, there's a, a progressively immunosuppression. Subtract a D4 from any saving throw related to diseases. Uh, the die increases every month. Uh, up to a D20. Jeez. That could suck. <laughs> then you also got uh, mascule skeletal issues. What's an interesting one out of there, uh, Brandon? Mascule skeletal? Parkinsonism. Oh, no. <laughs> Tried shooting a bow. <laughs> you lose proficiency with any tools that require precise movements, and you have disadvantage on sleight of hand checks. Oh, no. I'm speaking of uh, blows for, for respiratory system. <laughs> oh, that was an excellent segue, man. <laughs> also, I did <laughs> notice this while we were looking through this. Uh, every chart has the uh, the medic's cross next to it, mm-hmm. and it's colored based on its uh, colored liquid. Yeah, nice. Oh, that's cl- I didn't notice that. Like, brain is yellow, digestive is brown, endocrine is white, yeah. and so on. Very cool. A magical respiratory system is fire cough. Once, there it is. Once every 10 minutes, you cough, dealing yourself one fire damage and 1d4 to anyone sitting within five feet of you. Oh, that's hilarious. That would be awesome if, if a, a, a dragonborn gets that and you change the element to whatever their natural element is. That would yeah. be really cool. Uh, I, just, I, I just realized the point of that. Uh, the endocrine is white. And come on, load. Uh, the immune system is white. So if you see that light, white liquid, it can be from either or. Oh, so it can be confusing. Yes, it's like, okay, he has one of these two problems, but we don't know which one yet because it hasn't you need, spread it hasn't gone to another, uh, another symptom. Yep. Very that's, cool. That's pretty neat. There's a lot of brown, though. Yeah, there's a, there's a, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think there's a lot of brown in my toilet after Ian visited it, too. Um, so uh, <laughs> I flushed. So the last thing I want to touch on as far as the, the symptoms is they have special racial symptoms. So, magical symptom, flappy wings. Your wings flap at an immense rate, and you cannot stop it. You create a harmless gust of wind in an area around you. <laughs> uh, small items may be thrown away. <laughs> Not to be confused with flappy bird. That's a terrible game. That's addicting. <laughs> you know what I mean? 
Oh, ouch. Like uh, uh, salt and vinegar potato chips. They're disgusting. I can't stop eating them. <laughs> <laughs> they also have one that's similar, except for your claws may start to crack and stuff, which I think is pretty cool, which limits how much damage you can do with those. So that that's th- those are pretty cool. They did such an amazing and thorough job on on the, the symptoms, which you could take any one of those symptoms and, and, and start using it in your game if you decided not, even not to use oh. build an entire... Uh, Entire uh, disease out of it. Did you read Mushy Hoofs? No, I didn't. Your hoofs are no longer hard enough to deal with difficult terrain. For every 100 feet of difficult terrain you travel, a mountain, for example, you take one point of damage. Damn. That sucks. Ooh. Even though it's for, quote, hooves, we have a halfling got these. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, moving on beyond the symptoms is the diagnosis. Now, um, according to the Mad Mage, as a student of maladies, you need to be able to discern them with ease, understand how one is presented to you, and you will slowly understand how it works. Listen to the patients. They have so much to say, even if you've got to cut off their tongue. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> um, so uh, identifying the, the diseases is is pretty important and they give you all the the stats and the correct um values in which check is needed to identify them um and that's super important as i mentioned earlier not every disease the players come across is going to be a medicine check some are going to be religion checks others are going to be arcana um so it's important for the the dm to make sure that he understands that and that the players understand that do they cover paras- parasites in this i don't recall reading that why well, that is a legitimate form of like uh, s- things that cause diseases or disease-like symptoms. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I don't know. I guess we'll have to pay a little closer attention. Um, I, I don't recall saying it. Yeah, so. I don't. I don't either. But doesn't mean it wasn't in there. Um, so also doesn't mean you can't make it an option. That's true. Ooh, I like that. Yeah. Um, so now uh, they give you uh, difficulty DCs for each of the the um, leth- uh, There's another lethality table that basically. Uh, Depending at what stage of the process you catch it determines the the type of um, DC it is. Um, and they call uh, a 5 DC as elementary. An average commoner would be able to figure it out compared to a 20 that's knowledge only accessible to experts or particular ailment, uh, uh, of particular ailments. So that would be very difficult to find because not anybody can identify. It's an additional condition that, okay, here's the conditions, but only this person can this type of person can find it, which I think is interesting Mm -hmm. because it forces the players to seek out somebody as opposed to just rolling really high and say, Oh, magic it away. Um, which I'm, I mean, that's cool, (laughs) but that kind of is not nearly as much fun. Um, can you, what can you tell us about cures? Cures? Well, it's an okay band, I suppose, but (laughs) Brandon, what can you tell us about cures? (laughs) Uh, that's, there are some, so wow, are, thanks for clearing so, that up. So, I appreciate up. it. Some are easy, some are hard, and some are just plain out impossible. Um, and they, they actually, looks like they go through and actually tell you which every single spell does that can be used to uh, remove certain effects. Um, it looks like True Resurrection is probably the only one that cures everything <laughs> like next to Mass Mass Heal and True Resurrection, but you've already died. So, Doctor, <laughs> how do we cure this guy? Well, um, we're going to have to kill him and then use True Re- Resurrection. <laughs> That's um, a horrible plan. <laughs> could, you, could you imagine? Um, I guess if I have no other choice, stab him. Um, doctor? Yeah? We're missing the primary component for that spell. <laughs> uh, put it on ice. <laughs> He can just chill. <laughs> okay, um, get off of I just said, I'm like, why did I feel like this a Rick and Morty episode right there? <laughs> <laughs> um, they do give um, some detail. Like, a, there's actually a chart that gives you, like, a one quick glimpse to see what they do, which is pretty cool. They break down the different magical items that uh, heal things, like Kogenton's ointment. It cures all diseases. The parapet of uh, Periop. Uh, Periot? Periopt. Periopt of health suppresses current disease and grants immunity to diseases. Um, paladin's land hands. That requires... Uh, Having a paladin? Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Dick. <laughs> <laughs> and this is one thing that's really interesting. I hear a lot of people don't really consider the transmutation wizard pretty powerful, but their master transmuter, the Panacea... Um, Panacea? 
what the fuck ever, dude? <laughs> Who cares? Stumble, stumble, stumble. Um, it cures all diseases, so that makes it a very pot- potentially a great uh, archetype for uh, a character who. Uh, is going to be in an adventure where your DM uses a lot of this sort of stuff, giving it a lot more value, especially if you don't have like a healer or anything. But as a DM, you have to keep these sorts of things in mind. Um, another thing to kind of touch on, I, and I might be wrong, might be incorrect, but I think a lot of these spells require cost cost effective uh, materials. So as the DM, they can take these spells, but if you don't give them an opportunity to get the uh, actual material to use it. Even at higher levels, these diseases are now problematic because if you don't give the material you need to cast, you know, mass heal, if any, I don't know specifically oh my on that one. Do you, anybody? Was well, our character no. constantly begin for the <laughs> I forgot. New idea. A character that, that cures diseases by, by killing the patient and then resurrecting them. <laughs> <laughs> you just lost 10 cool points for that. <laughs> no, you did because you gave it to me. <laughs> Um, so there's a lot of different things in here. They give you a, like a disease, uh, rarity. Um, they give you a whole collection of different, uh, treatments, um, which is pretty cool. And then of course they top it off with different plot hooks, which is just fantastic. Um, and they I think they even give you a magic item in here. That's all about that. Like the Wanda viral infection. That doesn't sound helpful. No. <laughs> <laughs> Not for curing. <laughs> you get a plague and you get a plague. <laughs> I'm going to run a character with this namer Harpo. <laughs> Harpo? Harpo? Oprah, backwards. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to call my, uh, make maybe make her a cleric and call it the Harpo Foundation. Hey, uh, let, let me ask you something. Yeah, completely off, off topic here. Have you ever made a a character at all with a regular name? I don't. Only if I stole the name. Only if you stole it. Like, I played Kaladin, but I definitely got that from the books I'm reading, uh, Stormlight Archives. Yeah. Oh, I think he's, he's upset because yesterday, I, uh, in one of my characters was a thief bard named Robin Banks. Yeah. Every, every character he's ever played is some, sort, some form of a pun, and it's driving me fucking crazy. <laughs> mm. yeah. Whatevs. Like, uh, like his heal, healer on uh, Wildstar? Who was it? Van Helsing? Van Helsing? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> I forgot about that. Or my Grenock, my my Dwayne Grenock Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I think the other one was Arnold Schwarzenegger. Because <laughs> they're big uh, stone men. Anyways, we're derailing. I definitely made a uh, fire monk in fourth ed named uh, Bazoo of the Cock Clan. <laughs> Bazooka, motherfucker. What the fuck, man? <laughs> <laughs> um, so there's a lot of stuff uh, in, in this, and they've got an outro and hooks that you can use, which I think are fantastic. Um, they also have this really cool Appendix A called Juice Theory. <laughs> so it takes the four juices that it mentions earlier and puts them on like a graph and shows kind of how they... Yeah, it's a pie chart. Medical students love their graph. Yeah, clearly. <laughs> um, they, they do give additional example uh, diseases. Um, one such disease is called the, uh, the, the where, what is that? The where cowism? The oh mooing goodness. disaster? What the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> the origins. <laughs> According to legend, this disease was created when a ruthless spirit of the forest bestowed a cow with the power to spread this disease. This way, this, uh, this way, the spirit would be able to drive settlers away from its lands. <laughs> wow. Mm. Uh, that's fucking funny. I just realized <laughs> that you could uh, color code some of these even better, too. Oh, yeah? Like, a, like red and yellow. You put them together, it makes orange. And you see the orange juice, and it's like, oh, shit. It's one of, like, four different things. <laughs> <laughs> Three, actually? Robin Banks. That almost <laughs> sounds like a porn name. Um, who says it's not? Maybe that's what uh, Robin does at night when she's not Robin Banks. <laughs> Robin, you. <laughs> uh, anyways, um, Why? overall, what is your guys' thoughts on this process, this this product, making your own diseases, this workshop it's that these gentlemen have made? Super in depth on how to get it around. Oh and yeah, it, it's it seems like it could be a lot of fun, especially if you have your own ideas. Like um, I remember, yeah. You know, as children, you're, and you're and you're playing with your toys, and you just think of different random ways of killing people. <laughs> yeah, that's the same same concept, except this lets you do it <laughs> in, in your own twisted way. Um, so, uh, 
once again, I want to give a shout out to the creators, Jason Baca, Bacos and uh, Themis Paraskevas. Sorry, I'm American and dumb, so I can't. Paraskevas, is that right? Paraskevas. Um, I'm American and I can't figure this shit out, so I apologize. Um, he's going to be like, I'm American too, fucker. <laughs> <laughs> like sorry um but anyways you guys did an absolute phenomenal job the artwork is amazing the cover is awesome it's creepy as fuck like a guy what is the name of that kind of mask the plague, plague, plague doctor the plague doctor mask plague yeah doctor. It's, it's, it makes it even better because it's got a uh, crown of thorns on his head oh i didn't notice that <laughs> that's dope and there's like heart bloody heart in between it it's pretty dope really wonderful art i think the art was done by uh by uh good stuff Gal Galganet of uh, Deviant Art. It's beautiful. Anyways, um, overall, it's an amazing product. If you enjoy the product, you can find a link in our show notes when the show goes live, or you can head on over to uh, if you're in Twitch right now. Go down below and uh, click the little link. If you're on mobile, I don't know where that shit goes on mobile, but uh, <laughs> it's in our little thing below. Actually, I'll go ahead and post the link right into the chat um, here. I should have did that to begin with. Check actually. it out, check it out, check it out, check it out, check it out. There. What I like about this is it's the same concept that was done with a, a mobile mobile game called Plague Inc. Uh-huh. Oh, yeah, I love that game. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I totally spent a dollar on it. <laughs> Plague Inc. is a, it's a strategic game where you start off as a virus, uh, which... That's one you, option, yeah. You start off as a disease. You're yeah. either a bacterial, virus, fungal, your nanotechnology, whatever. Parasitic. And the entire objective is the game of the game is to infect every human on the planet Earth and kill them all before they cure you. That sounds awesome. And it was developed by a professor to teach his students how specific diseases uh, transfer from place to place. Didn't that happen in World of Warcraft? Like, a game plague like happened and just due turned a, the game desolate? Yeah, due to an in-game glitch. Yeah, yeah it was... It was... Crazy, and then I guess some people use that as a model for spread uh, the, the CDC. It, yeah, yeah, CDC does. Um, anyways, so I just want to say you guys did a phenomenal job. Kudos to reaching platinum on this product. Um, I'm sure it'll get all the way up to adamantine. You guys do amazing work. This is an awesome product. If you like to find interesting ways to kill your players besides stabbing them with a sword or dropping them in a pit, <laughs> this is an amazing way to do that. Um, also check out the Malady Codex if you want to hear what that is. Go back to episode 109 of Crit Academy. We talk about it, and we had a blast covering that too. I'm pretty sure there was an S a STD, a weird STD in there, wasn't there? Probably. I think so. <laughs> I think so. I remember laughing hysterically for some reason. <laughs> uh, all right, I think that'll do it for our main topic today. But before we move on, on to our unearthed tips and tricks segment, we have another gift to give away. Compliments of Lore Smith. Of Lore Smith. Where's that? There you are. Each episode, we will draw another lucky subscriber's name, and they will win the best-selling adventure, The Claws of Madness, compliments of Lawsmith. Lawsmith is a small indie team of creative artists who remember exploring the realms together with friends, finding incredible places, and meeting colorful characters along the way. They set out to deliver an experience that sparks those lasting impressions that pushed them to create their first standalone adventure, The Claws of Madness. This best-selling adventure is one that you don't want to miss. Ian, who's our winner today? Our winner today uh, is from YouTube, Brandon Cullen. I apologize for that. Uh, congratulations to Brandon <laughs> Cullen. Um, I got your subscriber name from YouTube. So um, please, if you want to collect your prize, email us at critacademy at gmail.com. Um, and I will see if I can reach through YouTube because I'm really not sure how to do that. Um, if you would like to be entered to win these things, follow us on uh, here on Twitch. Follow us on um, YouTube. Go to Crit Academy. There's a link in the uh thing that the panel down there and you'll be entered to win Yay. every week we give away fat loots you should have another button to push no i don't yeah you do it's orange and it's on the far right and now what you've all been we waiting do that for <laughs> our unearth tips and tricks segment where we bring you new and reusable material for both players and dms <laughs> I'm going to abuse the board now. Oh, my God. Um, so our first unearthed tips and trick is our character concept. Those who slay together, stay together. 
<laughs> um, this comes from patron Gabe. Thank you, Gabe. If you haven't listened to Gabe's inner party conflict, you should. The show is awesome. Um, so I can't. Um, I want. Can you? Can any of us do a Gabe impression? No. Damn. Because we're not Gabe. Oh, man, we're not, we're not Gabe. That's too bad. <laughs> So I came to a, I got, so I came up with a character concept that's a not, while back. That's not Gabe. They don't know that. <laughs> uh, that is a married couple. Imagine a husband and wife who always wanted to go adventuring, but they own a business and they can't afford to close up shop and just go gallivanting off in search of treasure. So instead, one of them stays back and tends the shop while the other one joins the party and goes adventuring. But periodically, they switch places. The husband went adventuring last time, but this session he stays home while the wife picks up her sword and shield and goes in his place. Now, in my mind, they would both be the same class, so to keep good party composition. You're so generous, Gabe. I don't give a shit about party composition. I'm going to play what I want, (laughs) but that's just me. Uh, but each has their own specialty. Maybe he's more defensive and she's more, you know, offensive. Or he's more knowledgeable and she's more stealthy. Then, at the end of each adventure, they meet back home and take turns telling each other about their day while rubbing each other's feet. Aww, that's so adorable. What do you guys think? That's kind of a fun concept, yeah. That is a fun concept. That sounds great. <laughs> I love it because I love to play melee and bar- uh, wizard. So just being able to jump back whenever, back and forth between the two whenever I want would be awesome. I believe that's called troop play. Troop play? That's a thing. Yeah, when you have like a uh, troop of characters, <laughs> they, you, you pick one. I've never, I never knew that. I, mean, I think it's a neat idea to be able to play two different characters in the same game, just that you play one at a time. I was going to make a joke about you never showing up, but you've actually been doing a really fantastic job, so I can't. Surprise, um. motherfucker. <laughs> With fries. Um, I think this is fantastic, Gabe. I think it's a clever idea. It's also a good opportunity for somebody that loves to role player, role player, uh, loves to role play and wants Giggity. to change it up. You can have two completely different personalities <laughs> and, and swap between them, uh, you know, between sessions, which I think is just an awesome idea. Uh, that'll do it for our character concept by Gabe. Those who slay together stay together, but technically they don't slay together because they're not there at the same time. Yeah, but that means they also very rarely stay together. I should really think that title. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, our monster variant of the day. Uh, Ian, do you want to tell us what our monster variant is? The green scale darter. The origin of this is the lizard folk. The loss features are the you just. You drop the javelin in the shield, and the strength score becomes 10. But the new features is that their deck score becomes 15, and they gain a new weapon in the form of a blowgun. And it can also fire off the... What the... the diplopia? Diplopia dart. <laughs> That's what I thought it was. I'm like, like yeah. what the... What is that word? The, the, diplom- <laughs> the diplomacy dart. <laughs> <laughs> you shoot them, and they do what you want, because they're poisoned. I object! <laughs> <laughs> and now I've got it's the it's diseased, and now they got to do what you say because you got the cure. Yeah. Uh. On a hit, the target must succeed on a DC 13 Constitution saving throw, or they are poisoned for one minute. They begin seeing two images of objects and creatures. All attack on the creature have advantage while they are poisoned by this effect. Uh. If the target succeeds on a saving throw, they are Im- immune to this effect for the next 24 hours. And they also gain Sharpshooter. Uh-oh. Yeah. Attacking at long range does not impose disadvantage on the darter's range weapon attack rolls. And the darter can use... Eh. And the darter's range atta- attack ignores half cover and three quarters cover. Oh, and they also have Sniper. And the hidden darter that misses with a range attack remains hidden. And they have some tactics. They like to... Uh, the green skill darter likes to hide in undergrowth. Attacking with their blowguns and using stealth and sniper skills to remain hidden. What do you guys think about this? Clever. Hey. It, it's it's it sounds scary. Yeah, mm. I bet it'd be hard to find too. <laughs> Green in the bushes. Just sitting. Um, <laughs> so one what of the, the fuck? Something just bit me. <laughs> one of my favorite characters we did uh, our monster variants was the Goblin Napper, <laughs> also in our Unearth Tips and Tricks book. 
Um, <laughs> Three darts is too much. Um, and in the goblin napper, it hides in the brush and it shoots people with darts that knock you out. Well, this one seems interesting, or this one seemed interesting because having a uh, the characters have a visual discrepancy kind of gives every enemy the uh, displacement beast ability. Um, if they fail the constitution check, which I think is, is fantastic and terrifying at the same moment, because if they don't know that they're the, the, under the effects of this, um, and all of a sudden two giant ogres start charging at them, that's terrifying. And the, uh, barbarian just might think they, uh, were at the bar for too long. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look at that. He, the Ace Ventura me- reference. I'm glad you guys liked it. <laughs> Thanks, Monty. <laughs> we are cool cats like that um, but anyways I really like this I love the very stealthy type characters that can hit players before combat begins so let's say these guys are ambushing maybe they never reveal themselves maybe they hit the players with this and they're poisoned uh, for one minute and somebody else comes out and, and ambushes them so you may never know that this thing is stalking you um, at least that's kind of my, my thoughts on it. It's yeah. another, I mean, and it can shoot from a long range too, a much longer range with the sharpshooter feature, um, uh, making it, uh, uh, otherwise simple encounter, much more challenging for the players. <laughs> and the sniper feature too, if they miss, you're not going to know. Right. They get to keep trying until they hit you. Like when you walk into a room full of stealth spiders and you don't realize they're attacking you when they're missing you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think that'll do it for our monster variant, the green scale darter. Our encounter of the podcast. Now, I'm really excited for this. So um, we release a lot of content. Um, I work on a lot of stuff, and I I, I do all that good stuff. Um, I'm working on something right now, uh, skill challenge encounters. Um, Fourth edition got a really bad rap. It did, um, but it had it was an, undeserved. It had an amazing thing in it called skill challenges. Uh, if you remember, we actually re- we covered an episode, uh, if I'm not mistaken, on skill challenges by R. P. Davis. I think you guys remember that? Yeah, good stuff. Um, that was episode uh, uh, 107 skill challenges, and it really got me thinking that I could do a whole collection of. Uh, of these, so I'm building something, and this encounter is out of it. It is one of the examples I use called "Defenders in Need." Um, the priestess turns her head to the pews, gesturing with her holy symbol as she bids you to sit. Why is it you seek the aid of my Templars? Now, in this encounter, are our, our heroes? Because they're BA mofos, and we need a few of those right now. <laughs> <laughs> Our heroes are attempting to gain the assistance of a local NPC, in this case, the priestess and her Templars. So the challenge link, it can kind of vary depending on how you want to do it. If you want to run the game that you need these for a big event, so you need to take over place over weeks or months or days or whatever, um, you can easily... Um, uh, separate it out with other kind of adventures and have it as an ongoing discussion, right? You can go in, you could have them make a single check. Um, uh, the primary skills in this one are deception, persuasion, and insight. Um, so you may have them meet with her once and she'll give them a little bit and you could have one person give a um, persuasion check, right? And you say, uh, it says, you entreat the NPC to aid you in your quest. The first success in this opens up a history skill as she recounts a past uh, event of significance to her. So now it opens up another thing that when you guys, when the heroes walk out from that conversation, they come back and say, hey, she was talking about this. Maybe we can drudge up some information about it or maybe you already know it. Um, And it leads into this um, chain of attempts on in this negotiation. Um, what, what, what does, what, what would they, what would you report out for like a deception? Like it says, uh, you attempt to encourage the NPC to aid your quest using false information. So this gives you a format cause I don't, some PCs like, like Ian over here already have it all fleshed out. Yep. Right. So in this encounter, we kind of give you some ideas of what you can fill in there. Um, but the DM and the players can go back and forth as much as you want. But the goal is to get seven complete successes before three failures. Yeah. So instead of just doing a single check and being done, it's a collection of checks to uh, complete a complex encounter. So now the question is, Brandon, what happens if they succeed? Now, 
in our encounters, we have three scales. We have total success, means they didn't get a single failure, then success, and then failure. Brandon, would you tell us a little bit about total success? We got total the success. Uh, the NPC agrees to provide aid that is within reason to the characters. So that's pretty straightforward. They won. They got what they needed. No, Nothing, right? But... That's a total success. What about a regular success? A regular success is uh, the NPC agrees to provide aid, but has a special request of them. Ah. I have conditions. Yeah. So, yeah. And that's not uncommon, right? Nope. So the players won't ever know that they could have got it way easier. They just end up with this. What about failure? Failure. The, the characters are forced to act without aid from the NPC, and the encounter's difficulty is increased, either by more enemies, an additional trap, or some other circumstance. Or less, uh, I think, aggro. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Um, so overall, we give you some different um, tools to kind of help cha uh, challenge that. But overall, the players need help from these people, and you have to – they have to go through this skill challenge to hopefully a a acquire her assistance and get the help of the Templars. What do you guys think? Yeah, that's a pretty decent one and uh, straightforward. I think it's a nice one. It, it's one of the things I missed from 4th edition was uh, skill checks. Skill challenges. Checks. Challenges. 5e has checks. Yeah, checks. <laughs> uh, skill challenges. Not the cereal. Like the mix? Or the thing you give to banks. <laughs> what? <laughs> I don't have any money. I don't give banks nothing. Um, anyways, um, it's a pretty simple challenge. Uh, defenders in need. What I like about this one and the reason I picked it, it's one of the examples in the book. Um, and because of that, you can use this same template in any sort of negotiations and just reflavor the, um, the, the text, right? So I think that'll do it for our encounter, the skill challenge, Defenders in Need. Brandon, why don't you tell us about our magic item? I'll tell you about our magic item for the week. It's called the Hammer of Storms. It is a weapon, and it is a war hammer. Obviously. Uh, it is rare. <laughs> it requires attunement. When you wield this hammer, the power of the storm rages within you. When the power is released, it blasts your enemies with a thunder and lightning. Are you, what? <laughs> Do you not know what thunder and lightning is? Yes, yeah, yeah. Why are you confused? Because you're a Avengers fan. Whatever. Actually, I didn't make this item. I adapted it from 4th edition. Thank you very much. Well, then they like Avengers. I mean, I changed it ex extensively, but the name is from it. <laughs> That's where I got it from. When you score a critical hit with a melee attack using this weapon, you may choose to speak with the command word and cast the Thunder Wave spell from it at its lowest sp level with a spell save DC of 14. Half the damage is converted to lightning damage. This property can't be used again until the next dawn. Thunder. Uh, this weapon's damage dice is also doubled due to the critical hit rules. Okay. Nice. So what do you guys think? Yes. Can't imagine where this came from. <laughs> it's Thor's hammer, pretty much. But this doesn't come back to you when you throw it, though. So hmm? No, that would be the Dwarven thor Thrower. Yeah. It's two different items in this. <laughs> now, what's really cool, in 4th edition, magic items are much more common. So there was a lot of flavor to this about what happens when a bunch of them come together and hammer at once, basically like creating like a thunderstorm or something. It was really dope. Yeah, um, fourth ed, they were like, get, you could probably get them from vending machines. Was, oh yeah, like, it was great. You, you could just knock <laughs> over a box and magic items roll out. Um, it was but anyways, great. <laughs> I really like this one. It's simple. It's fun. It's straightforward. I like the the balance of the two different elements in one attack. Um, that gives it a little bit more versatility, too. So <laughs> There is no common one. It's like, your quest is to find the Holy Grail. <laughs> Which go, one? You go, all right, hang on. You go over to uh, uh, the janitor, look in his pocket. Here you go. <laughs> <laughs> Don't drink out of it. might be the wrong one. <laughs> <laughs> and Tater's like, hey, you get my money. I just log it as chump change. <laughs> <laughs> it must be nice to have chump change. Chump. Uh, all right, so I think that'll do it for our magic item. Um, actually, one more thing. What's cool about this, and I didn't write any flavor on it, and shame, shame on me, but um, when, you, when you get a magic item that isn't super full of flavor or there's not an image in the book, feel free to, to, to wrap it in whatever flavor you want. Dead for, foil. For, oh, Bacon. I was going to say, for instance, if I was like a Goliath, I would totally like have it just be like a, a rock on the end of a tree. Or something stupid. Maybe it's just a rock, right? It's literally the hammer of storms, and it's just like a magical space stone or something. Or um, get get intricate with your weapons. Make thunderbolts on the side of it. I mean, do when you make have a magic item, try to attune it to whatever – attune it. That's probably not the right word. No. Um, try to give it as much love and uniqueness to yourself, unless your DM gives you something that's already predefined. But you can have fun with it. I took my hammer to the paint, Chef.
Ugh, okay. That'll do it for our magic item. I had an airbrush Thor on the side of it. <laughs> Ian, would you like to tell us about our Dungeon Master tip? Our Dungeon Master tip is NPC extras. Playing a lot of different NPCs can sometimes, maybe all the time, become a lot of work. <laughs> Especially when it comes to creating different personalities for you to play out. M- maybe. Just maybe. Consider asking a player at the table to play an important NPC. Some players revel in the opportunity to play out some more than one characters, especially they they too are a DM. Ooh. Considering giving them an NPC you plan to have as a recurring role. This could be a noble, merchant, or maybe even just a strange village idiot. <laughs> if you want it to get real interesting, consider giving them an important villain role too. This can pull a lot of weight off your shoulders and end up giving you some very surprising results. <laughs> yeah, I like I, I really like this idea because um p- one of the biggest challenges in my opinion of being a DM is constantly making all the characters seem different. Uh, me, I only have two or three voices that I can, different voices that I can really do really well. I've got the Russian voice. I do okay. Not bad. Not great, but not bad. And then I have the high squeaky goblin voice and I really like it, but that's pretty much all I got. (laughs) And so, um, I run out of juice quickly. So being able to turn to (laughs) Ian, who can do the impression of the gangster, I'm going to make you an offer you can't refuse. (laughs) He's fucking amazing at it. Or Brandon that can do... The Sean Connery thing. Yes, this is this is a Sean Connery. So being able to pass <laughs> out NPC uh, um, characters to the the players can really let you do other things as a DM. Maybe you need a few minutes to stall. It does it really matter if you know you, the players are going to get three bullet points of information if you just give it to this person? Say, here's the personality. This is your character. Run with it. I still love the time where I once said uh, GM the game and they. Uh, players had to escort a senile old man. I played it so well that when my players doubled over facing the hands and out of the went, God, I hate old people. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyways, I think this is a great way to g- bring your game to life and pull a little bit of weight off yourself. Um, and if you get into those games where you run out of prepared material, giving them a villain or something to fight really quick uh, and having another person take that over is a good way to give you time to um, add content without stopping the game. Um, so, Brandon, you got any comments to that? You need to broaden your horizons. Would you say they have to broaden their log horizons? <laughs> I love that anime. It's really good. You should watch it. Uh, any other tops on this tip here? Well, don't be afraid about any surprises you may get from your players if you hand them off some material. Oh, that's right. I can do the southern thing. I think that mostly has to do with my time in Texas. And there goes our vill- our viewers from the south because they didn't think we're making fun of them. <laughs> Just the ones from Arkansas. Who are not doing that? Arkansas. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Um. Arkansas. <laughs> it's how cows actually born down in Virginia. Uh. It's hot down there. It's high noon. All right, uh, that'll do it for our Dungeon Master tip, the extra uh, NPC extras. Our player tip of the podcast is... Don't, don't be a dick. dick! And you can avoid dickitude with threats and intimidation. Now... Isn't that being a dick? <laughs> yes, I realize the irony. Thank you. Uh, so we all know that intimidation check checks are absolutely fantastic and a a great way for an adventure to really strut their stuff sometimes though we leave it to the throw of the dice or a simple i hurt you sometimes that's okay right this is generally good enough which was the next line ian's getting ahead of me but (laughs) with a little bit of research we can come up with some pretty memorable one-liner threats movies are fantastic for this so Without further ado, we're about to insult you all. <laughs> Why don't you shut your mouth, or I'll kick your teeth down your throat so far you'll have to eat and talk through your asshole. What the fuck is that from? I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> Brandon? If you don't tell me what I want to know, sure, I'll let you go. But one night I'm going to come to you while you're sleeping, and I'm going to slit your throat. 
<laughs> it's not <laughs> passive aggressive at all. Ian? If I so choose, I can use my magic to make you think turning your brain to mush was a birthday present. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my gosh, that's awesome. <laughs> you better not mess with me, buddy, or I'll kick your ass so hard you'll have to untie your tunic to take a sheet. <laughs> oh god. Oh my god. Where did I find this shit? Uh everyone knows where this one came from. I'm going to give you exactly three seconds to wipe that stupid looking grin off your face or I'll gouge out your eyeballs and skull fuck you. <laughs> that was uh, Full Metal Jacket. Full Metal Jacket, right? gummy. Yeah. Yeah, he, He's going to do to your skull what Dennis does to them. <laughs> How tall are you? <laughs> Five foot four. Bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I love the opening scene. Uh, before are you cleared? <laughs> no, sir. Bullshit. I bet you could suck a golf ball through a garden hose. <laughs> <laughs> uh, why don't you take the next one Ian? <laughs> uh, <laughs> don't mess with the minotaur fool or you'll get the horns that's a pretty good one pretty stable one especially if you're a minotaur <laughs> stable <laughs> <laughs> unintentional fun oh my god <laughs> <laughs> if you don't do what I want I'll make you dead your family dead. I'll burn down your house to the ground and then piss on the ashes. <laughs> <laughs> so, the, the point of this... <laughs> I'm going to start beating on your face till I see tonsils. <laughs> <laughs> when it comes to threats, you can do so much with it. It doesn't have to be I roll to intimidate. <laughs> Deliver on that shit. Threaten to kick their balls up so high it pops out their mouth, okay? <laughs> Whatever you got to do. You know what? If you're a dwarf, threaten to chop down their, chopped off their legs to bring them down to your height so they can fight a man of their stature. What is it? Fight a man Fight a man of their own size. You need to shut your mouth. You got to stick so far up your ass that thing you call your nose is the bump of the stick. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, threats are fun and can be really a uh, great way to get some fun, memorable moments out of your D&D experience. Uh, yeah. Use intimidation. It's fantastic. You know what? You make a move, you die first, get it? Your friends might get me in a rush, but not before I make your head into a canoe. Understand me? <laughs> oh my god. This is this is this is from Tater. I will go back in time and slap your mama and stick you back in, asking her a refund of your daddy's deposit. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, that's fantastic. If I wanted my comeback, I would have wiped it from your lip. <laughs> Oh, shit, you guys. Uh, our show is not suitable for young children. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I think that'll do it for our player tip. <laughs> Don't be... Motherfuckers. I'm sorry. You I'm... got one goddamn job. I'm still giddy. <laughs> <laughs> We're laughing, okay? That'll do it for our player tip. Don't, Don't be, be a, a dick. dick. And you can avoid dickitude by... By being a dick. <laughs> by being a dick. <laughs> with your intimidation and threats. Oh, man. That's glorious. Uh <laughs> Brandon, uh, uh, well, that'll do it for our show today. Um, before we close out, we have another gift to give away. Compliments of Jeff Stevens. Oh, good God. A small village, empty of villages, except for one boy, <laughs> found sitting and weeping next to a jester's pageant wagon. The boy explains that the villagers, including his family, followed a jester into the wagon and never came out. What madness could the adventurers face? Can they save the villagers? Or will they go mad trying? Can you survive the madhouse of Tasha's kiss? Oh, you know, one fuck. of these days I'm going to have to figure out what button like turns all of it off so our voices don't come through during that. <laughs> um... Brandon, who's our winner today? Oh, God. Our winner is our God Dard 06. Our Goddard 06. Our Goddard 06. 
you still got the buttons. Yes, yes, I got the buttons. Yeah. Thought we were gonna be doing applause. You happy? <laughs> well, I'm sorry that you're sick, Sarah. We missed you. That sucks. <laughs> um, congratulations to our raw dog. No, our our <laughs> Goddard. Arachtana. Arachtana. Our. What did you say it was? Goddard. Goddard. Our Goddard. Oh six. If you enjoy the adventure, please leave Jeff Stevens a review. Let him know what you thought of his product. Um, leaving a review is one of the best things you can do for content creators. So make sure you take a minute to even give him a rating, which is fantastic. What the crap? Type the name and chant. Okay. I'd be happy to. It says right uh, here that right now seven people are watching. But when I click the uh, chat screen to see how many we got, it's way more than seven. Is uh, it really? I, that shows our visitors over the uh, yeah, course over the of, the course of it, I think. Okay. Anyways, uh, so uh, really exciting. Uh, thank you, Jeff Seasons, for sponsoring our show. Um, <laughs> please join us on our next episode. We will be discussing Fifty Shades of Rage. <laughs> Reflavoring the Barbarian Signature Power. That did not sound sexy from you at all. I won't be here It's because I'm week. not sexy. <laughs> Why won't you be here next week? Because I'm not going to cover something called Fifty Shades of Rage. <laughs> <laughs> of course I'll be here. That was just a joke. Fifty Shades of Grey? Brendan Grey? Yeah, that's me. where I was going with that. <laughs> Fifty Shades of Me? Yeah, Fifty Shades of You? Uh. I've seen too many shades of you in the, the 25 years we've known each other. I think I'm good, thanks. <laughs> Um, anyways, I'm really excited for this because if there's one thing I love doing and I talk about it all the time is reflavoring. I reflavor my barbarians all the time. In fact, uh, what was the most recent uh, incarnation of, uh, reflavoring that I did? Do you recall? No. Oh, it was fucking yesterday. Are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> and how sleep deprived I was yesterday. Oh, whatever. I guess you guys will have to wait till next week to find out. Um, I really... <sighs> <laughs> oh yeah he is the first shade of gray <laughs> like a tater <laughs> the leash just says take it off baby oh. isn't the first shade of gray white <laughs> <laughs> i don't fucking know uh anyways um so uh if you have any feedback on our tips and tricks or topics you would like us to discuss please send them to us you can email them to us at criticademy at gmail.com or find us on twitter facebook and twitch at Crit Academy. Twitch. Twitch. And YouTube, we don't have an At Crit Academy yet, but someday, maybe. <laughs> uh, yeah, subscribe to us on Twitch and uh, YouTube. <laughs> That's you, Brandon. Yeah. Uh, we hope you've enjoyed your experience here at the Crit Academy, and if you did, you can help others find the show by leaving a hopefully five-star review on iTunes or platform of your choice. Or just send us a message telling us how much you enjoy the show. And also, be sure to give us a like and a share. Once again, if you'd like to support our show, there is a myriad of ways to do it. The easiest and simplest way to do it would become uh, a patron. Um, support our show for as little as $1 a month. Our top tier at 10, you get a plethora of content. Uh, I reviewed it earlier, but uh, it's the you get a one-page adventure every month. You get a um, free, or not free, a copy. <laughs> Thanks, asshole. You done fucked that up for me. You get a copy of our Unearthed Tips and Tricks book. You get a copy of our most recent uh, re release. And as long as you're a patron at that tier, any releases that come out while you're a patron, you also get. Um, you also get to join our Discord, our extra bonus short story or story time every month um, and some other good stuff. So definitely uh, check it out. Uh, Brandon takes commission art. Yeah. You can support us on DMs Guild. There's links right below. Um, if you are on desktop, apparently, because it doesn't show up in mobile, um, there's links directly in the panels to go right and check out some of our uh, products on DMs Guild. They're all uh, pretty, I think they're all four and a half or five star products. So yeah. check them out. Um, you can also find them at criticademy.com. Check out some stuff there. Um, I think that's it. So make sure to subscribe to our show at Crit Academy. Follow us on Twitch at Crit Academy, and subscribe to us on YouTube and help others uh, help. We can so we can help you on your future adventure as well as have a chance to be win cool prizes each and every single week. Make sure to check out our fellowship members as well. Um, a shout out to uh, Inner Party Conflict, um, Gabe and Jeff. Every week they answer your questions and deliver it in a much more professional manner and less cursy <laughs> way than we do. Uh, check out D&D &D Character Lab. As of a week or two, an episode we were in, or our 
they're covering some of our products here in a couple weeks, so keep an eye out for those guys. <laughs> I'm really excited for that. I had to send them a prize, so it's very funny, and I think you guys will love it. Um, also, check out uh, Brute Force and Ignorance. Um, for those that don't know, they're going on a hiatus. Um, one of our one of uh, the, the lead members is having uh, um, family health issues, so um, make sure you guys check them out and still support them uh, and continue to do so. Um, that being said, That's that'll do it for our show today. I am your host, Justin. I'm your co-host, Brandon. I'm your co-host, Ian. Thanks for listening. Keep your blades sharp and spells prepared, heroes. And before we go, I do have a question for you. What? Would you rather eat a thousand pounds worth of bricks or a matter baby? What the hell's a matter baby? Not much. What's up with you? <laughs> oh, my fucking God. <laughs> Uh, (laughs) Hook land sinker. I hate you, Brandon. Uh, What's that going on in chat? Oh, apparently I love you. (laughs) I recall hearing your name tossed around on the show in the past. Uh, Well, lol. Finally meeting the man, the myth, the legend. That's uh, Monty, the tater. That's Monty referring to Tater, the and tater. Ian, of course, says the beard. <laughs> <laughs> the great bearded one. <laughs> well, thank you guys for joining us today. We really appreciate it. We hope you enjoyed it. If you're not already following, make sure to hit those follow buttons, man. Um, and we will see you guys next week. Same bat time, same bat channel. Lawsuit. <laughs> Justin, edit that out. I do not want to get sued. I don't have anything. They're going to take all my D&D stuff because that's about all I've got of value. (laughs) Not my books. Well, and my wife. She's got quite a bit of value. Or so I'm told. I love you, honey. All right. Say goodbye. Goodbye. Bye, boy. Bye. (laughs)